Hi, everyone. Welcome and good afternoon. My name is Lauren Artilles, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science and the Harvard Library, I'm honored to introduce this virtual event with Adam Kucharski presenting his latest book, The Rules of Contagion, Why Things Spread and Why Stop in conversation with Dr. Bill. I hope everyone's week is off to a good start. Thank you so much for joining us virtually. Today's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. We've got an exciting slate of fall talks on the way. Coming up in the series next Thursday, September 22nd at 6 p.m. Eastern, we'll host the American Museum of Natural History's Bill Shutt for his new book, Pump, A Natural History of the Heart, joined in conversation by noticed science illustrator, Patricia J. Wynn. To learn more about this and our other upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. We also have a Science Research Public Lectures YouTube channel. We can be view previous talks that you might have missed and I'll be sharing the link for that in the chat shortly. Today's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. So if you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk, just click on the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase the Rules of Contagion on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like today's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you so much to our partners at Harvard University, and thank you to all of you for showing up and tuning in, in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science. And finally, as you may have experienced in previous virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. So if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm delighted to introduce this afternoon's speakers. Adam Kucharski is an associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and an award-winning science writer. A mathematician by training, his work on global epidemics has included Ebola, Zika, and COVID-19, and he has produced real-time analysis for multiple governments and health agencies. He is a TED Senior Fellow, and his popular science articles have appeared in publications, including The Observer, Financial Times, and Wired. He has an MMath in Mathematics from the University of Warwick, and a PhD in Applied Mathematics from the University of Cambridge. Dr. Bill Hannage is an Associate Professor of Epidemiology in the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. His research and teaching focuses on the epidem epidemiology of infectious diseases, and the evolution of infectious agents, and he has made seminal contributions to the study of diverse pathogens. His research on the current pandemic has included modeling transmission in healthcare and the impact of vaccination in the context of variants, how fatality rates vary with age, and how the virus evolves in individual hosts. His awards include the Fleming Prize from the Microbiology Society and a Young Investigator Award from the American Society of Microbiology. He has published more than 170 scientific articles and book chapters and is a regular contributor to popular media aiming to improve public understanding of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Today, they'll be discussing Adam's acclaimed book, The Rules of Contagion, newly out in paperback and revised in response to the current global COVID pandemic. Looking at everything from folk stories and epidemic social ills to actual viruses, Adam takes the framework of virality and applies it to a diverse set of real world examples so that we might better understand the mechanisms of outbreaks and how we might combat them in the future. The Times UK writes, it is hard to imagine a more timely book. Much of the modern world will make more sense having read it. And Jordan Ellenberg says, the rules of the contagion is a fascinating and richly detailed excursion into a science as old as biblical plagues and as current as today's headlines. The science of contagion, of disease, of ideas, of emotions, of everything. This is a book you'll want to spread to your friends. Without further ado, I'm excited to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Adam and Bill. Thank you. Lauren, um, I think you forgot to mention this is also going to be a British accent festival. Um, I'm coming to you live from my palatial basement office in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and Adam, you're somewhere on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, I am just outside London, um, calling in from Hertfordshire. Ah, Hertfordshire, nice part of the world. Um, and we're here to talk about your book. I've been wanting to do this ever since I used to watch John Stewart on The Daily Show doing it. This, fantastic book, um, The Rules of Contagion, 
which, as Lauren was saying, you know, why things spread and why they stop. I think people are quite interested in the, the stop part as well. I think that's a very important thing, which I'm sure we'll get to. Um, but as, as you know, Lauren was saying, I think the thing which is quite fascinating about this is even though we have a pandemic and even though this is about infectious disease, it's not only about infectious disease, is it? In fact, you know, once you once we start thinking about the details of how things transmit, then you can start seeing them everywhere. Exactly, yeah. And uh, I mean, the, the first version of this was written pre-COVID. And I think part of the idea um, of it was to branch out. And obviously, you know, we work in infectious diseases. A lot of the ideas that we put together have filtered to elsewhere. So it was really an attempt to talk to people in those areas, explore the research in those areas, and see how these ideas are feeding in. I mean, concepts like the, the reproduction number, concepts like the importance of network structure, how do you intervene? What are the constraints you have on a particular intervention? Um, a lot of those have, have filtered through from everything from finance, um, particularly post 2008, a lot of the things that were put in place. Um, we're seeing it in studies of violence in terms of you know, retaliatory gun violence, for example, in Chicago. Um, online information is obviously something that I think a lot of people are going viral, but what, what does that mean? You know, what are the, the factors that, that drive that and, uh, and what's our level of understanding? And then even things that are, are slightly more offbeat, you know, it, it was just fantastic to talk to people working on, on spread of behavior in, in different species, spread of culture. You know, if we get things like stories, how do those things um, evolve? And really just trying to find, find those different links and find, in some cases, fields that are a bit ahead of each other and, and some that have still got maybe a bit more catching up to do. It's interesting that you say ahead of each other versus catching up. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned 2008 because um, I'm old enough to have been around and known about the reproductive number and stuff before 2008, in fact, substantially before 2008. Um, so what, what is the, I mean, actually this is kind of like a meta question about this. You know, um, those ideas spread very quickly in the infectious disease community, but they didn't spread so quickly in the financial sector, or at least not until 2008. What do you think of the, limitations to these things it, it was quite striking talking to, to various people who'd kind of worked on some of the these aspects of, of the kind of epidemic spread through um financial systems i think pre pre 2008 or i guess 2007 when when it all started kicking off um a lot of the folks had been on individual institutions so it wasn't seeing it as a, a kind of sum of parts it was this institution what are they doing this different institution what are they doing uh but it was really during that, that crisis that a lot of what were seen as, as perhaps quite niche working papers came to, to prominence to explain what had happened. Um, because you had this situation where suddenly what seemed like quite a stable system that, that didn't have any problems, you had this huge shift and you had banks going under and you had a complete lack of trust. And these hidden loops that have been created, you know, these, these kind of counterparties or loans that no one had been keeping track of. Suddenly, it was almost that moment in an epidemic when people realise they have a much, much bigger problem than those, those glimmers on the surface were showing. Um, and it, you know, in research and book, talking to people, for example, at the Bank of England, it was very clear that this was a contagion story. This was something where there were, in some cases, direct analogies um, to, to historical outbreaks, you know, it, if you have an outbreak in an area, people might try and flee that area. Similar in finance, they might try and sell off whatever they're involved in. Um, you might get something where the system just, just seizes up. So, for example, if people just, yeah, even if things are open, if people just don't want to go out or don't want to go to certain venues. Um, and similarly, we had that just crisis of confidence um, going on. And what was remarkable, looking at the, the structure of the network, a lot of these things that it kind of be kicking around in the 80s in particularly study of sexually transmitted infections, you know, that there's certain features of network structure that yeah. allow core you know, groups kind of that kind of things. Yeah, core cool, you know, and we exactly the same thing in the financial network. You know, a huge proportion of transactions went through a relatively small number of banks. So you'd created these kind of super, super spreading institutions. Um, and so Lehman was was one and it's made them incredibly vulnerable. But you'd also, I mean, going back to work like John Potterat and co on gonorrhea, that if you had these kind of loops in your network, you had multiple ways that a single person could get exposed. And they had an enormous amount of these, these kind of so-called over-the-counter products, which 
just weren't visible on any kind of exchange. And so these banks have got themselves as a huge tangled network and no one had any idea where the exposures were. And a lot of these ideas, you know, were 20 years old in, in STIs, but it was only then I think people started realizing how important they were. That's fascinating. I mean, in fact, I mean, it, and it also counts to, I mean, two of the most important things in infectious disease, and I don't want to only talk about infectious disease, by the way, um, but two of the most important things are, as you say, that the network structure, which is so crucial to understanding both short and long term dynamics and risks of exposure, but also that that nonlinearity that, that arises from having these loops because that's an extremely crucial thing. I mean, and this is, I'm just curious to ask you at the moment, um, you know, what do you think, this isn't only about the book, this is just about science communication. What do you think of the challenges in communicating the risks of those nonlinear loops, those nonlinear dynamics? Because we've seen a lot of problems with that over the last 18 months. Yeah, I think it's enormously challenging. And I think in a lot of these, um, these fields, I mean, working on the book and, and sort of talking to different people with different challenges, I think there's often the te temptation to be quite descriptive, you know, in the kind of, you see something, that's what it is. I'm not going to take the logical step or the next one I need to, to understand it um, further. You know, and the, I mean, to use finance as an example, there was a kind of someone looked at one bank and thought they seem fine. Um, you know, likewise with, with COVID, I think just uh, it, it, things that if you're in the field are astonishing, but we're getting traction of people saying, well, we haven't got loads of ex excess deaths at the moment, so we haven't got a problem. And of course, once you start thinking through the logic, well, those events are representing something that was so much further back. Yeah. Um, you can you can get people to understand that, but it, it just takes a few more leaps. I think early on, similarly trying to to understand the extent of the problem um, that different countries had. I think there was a lot of reliance on, oh well, we you know in the US we've only detected so many cases, but obviously the testing structure wasn't there to find them in the first place. And I think it's that moving beyond that that quite descriptive thinking of like, oh well, we've only got so many positives to well, what are these underlying dynamics and the things that we know we should be expecting? And why does that conflict with what the data is actually suggesting in reality? But um, I mean, it's, it's an enormous challenge. And I know, you know, obviously something you've been involved in as well and trying to <laughs> yeah, get the communication of those points across. Yeah, I mean, I, it does strike me that, you know, the, the simplest model that you have to explain what's happened is you just, like you say, you have the lag. And there's a point at which people take action and it's always too late to stop things getting worse because of the fact of the lag. And so you get these repeated peaks. Um, I wanted to I wanted to ask you more specifically about um, the gun violence piece of it. And I say this because I have, I mean, my interest in this is that a few years ago, I had a student, uh, you're probably not watching Paul, but if you are, I hope you're doing well, um, who actually started investigating this because he, he was from Chicago and he had seen some of this and he was doing infectious disease epidemiology. And he actually, we, we never published it, but we produced a simple model as part of his thesis work in order to try and explain it. And I was just curious as to what, you know, you've spent time thinking about it as well. What did you find out? What can you tell us? So I think that, I mean, Chicago in particular has been some, some really fascinating work, um, part, partly on the, the sort of research side in trying to understand the, the network structure, you know, the social interactions and how these events may or may not propagate through them. I mean, it also just comes back to the sort of fundamentals of what is something that's contagious. And I think as soon as you have something where one event is predictive of another event occurring and you can identify some link and some network over, over which that's happening, then that enables you to move from a situation where you've just got a bunch of random events and it, it's almost that sort of fatalism of we don't know what to do about it. To one where there are some some predictable dynamics there's been a lot of work in actually just just quantifying this it's really interesting that those those features we see in a lot of more the, the stuttering end of infectious diseases so this isn't something of the reproduction number of three or four it's something more that you know you'll get sporadic events you'll get a couple of follow-up events you might get like a kind of super spreading cluster where there's quite a lot right but one thing that stands out is the time scale is much longer in these you know this isn't something that happens every sort of two or three days, often it'll be over weeks or months, you might get these, these kind of simmering um, uh, retaliatory uh, incidents. And that, from an intervention point of view, you know, if you have a network where you can identify links, it's the sort of logic of contact tracing, that you can identify people 
forward in that network that might be at risk and it gives you a, an opportunity to intervene so a lot of those ideas are translating over in terms of of what you need and the features in having you know clearly identified links obviously very clearly identifiable events um to to, to sort of trace from is you know, ha having some really promising implications a lot of these it's not just in the us they've translated it over into um in uk glasgow had a lot of success with these kind of so-called public health measures i think fundamentally it's about moving away from you know these are random events by bad people to there's a defined structure to what we're seeing here and how these propagate and it yeah. gives us opportunities to intervene this event at time t alters the risk of an event at time t plus however much yeah and that's, and that's important i mean one of the, the really early examples of it in the literature is um is suicide contagion that re you know essentially reporting your response on suicide you can get these follow-up attacks particularly you know a, a particular celebrity a particular method especially if it's attributed to a certain reason you might see after a certain period of time very similar incidents in very similar groups with very similar circumstances and so there's obviously now a lot of guidelines about how you avoid doing that and i think similarly with um, you know, unfortunately, with things like school shootings, there's been there's been evidence that um, reporting of those in some cases can uh, can lead to copycat attacks because you know the the way it's structured is kind of sparking an idea which unfortunately is leading to something further down the line. Yes, I'm I'm, I'm seeing more and more in contagion everywhere around me now at the moment. It's um, and you know I'm predisposed to do so. Um, one of the places where I see a lot of contagion, a huge amount of contagion, um, and I know that you're there as well, uh, is social media and Twitter. Um, I mean, I, obviously, all roads lead there. Uh, so, I mean, if I'm asking you what you, I mean, we're both on Twitter. To what extent has your understanding of going viral influenced your interactions on it? Um, and I mean, it's quite, it can be quite scary to go viral, to say the least. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, I, I certainly, you know, don't sit there trying to come up with TikTok content that's going to um, take off or anything. But I think for me, I mean, well, maybe a we should. The, maybe, maybe, yeah. this, maybe this isn't, this isn't, you know, an opportunity we should um, be actually pursuing. Um, I know, yeah, there are people who do it, do it very well. And it's, it's great when it eventually filters through to the kind of older bit of the network that I've got access to. Um, but it's, uh, it, I think one thing when I, when I was working the book that struck me, it, you know, it's not so much about, you know, how do I go viral and how do I get that, that sort of tweet or that post that takes off. But I think for me, it was much more about how do you have a healthier relationship with these platforms? Because a lot of what they incentivize is really unhealthy elements of, of kind of content and behavior. I mean, if you look at, you know, features of content that, that spread more easily, often, you know, it's things that are such strong emotional triggers. So particularly ones that are, um, I guess quite, you know, base emotion things like anger and disgust. You know, and there's there's good reasons for humans having strong responses to those kinds of things. Um, and then also, you know, in the network structure, things that are quite nuanced and need social reinforcement don't cope well in those kind of networks where most people are acquaintances. And so, you need things often that are quite simplified and sort of strip away detail. Um, but it has made me think a lot about how how we interact with those, and I think also just. There's a really nice study in, in Nature earlier this year about ability to um, evaluate truthfulness of, of online content. And if you get people to really focus in on accuracy, they'll often be able to, to make those assessments about whether it's accurate or inaccurate content. But these other aspects of, you know, we want something that's new, we want something that's useful, we want something that's, that's triggering all those responses. And that will override our ability to do that. And I know um, it was early last year, I think you and Mark Lipsitz had that, that nice piece, and one of them was just slow down you know just give yourself some time to not be kind of over overrun by the things which these platforms are totally designed for and i think for me that has been helpful haven't always got it right but it's it's thinking about you know how do i actually try and engage with this in a way that's slightly more healthy rather than just you know hopping on that emotional roller coaster um and it's all sort of following it to the bottom uh, without getting too much inside baseball i do tend to think that you know, science has been starting to pursue some of that, the dynamics of that in terms of the focus on preprints and the way in which we sort of get this suddenly racing after the preprint of the day. And you know, people say that every day there is one person on Twitter or there is, you know, Twitter is a story about one person and the, go the goal is to not be that person. And yeah. I kind of feel like 
there's something about the same thing with discussions of preprints. Um, every day there is one preprint being discussed on Twitter, and the goal is to not be publishing or trying to write that preprint, because some of them have not been terribly great. Um, and yet, of course, that races into the whole appetite for novelty and so on and so forth that we see within the news media. I mean, thinking, obviously, I'm fascinated, I was fascinated looking at this, that is it true that this basically came out, the first edition of this came out when the pandemic started? It came out in, yeah, February 2020. Bloody hell. In, in the UK. Um, that, um, wow. Well, timing. Um, that's, I mean, obviously, <laughs> it's an obvious question. What would, how would you write it or how would you start it if you were doing it now? Yes, that's, that's something I thought about quite I mean, especially the, the paperback, I made a few adjustments, but obviously, you know, you can't chuck away a book and write the whole thing again. Um, Absolutely. But one, I think a couple of things stand out for me. So one is the, the first version when it came out, I think there were some reviews that saw it as quite technical, actually, and, and, and almost a bit niche. Um, and a lot of these, you know, concepts that were seen as insurmountable and overly technical are things like the reproduction number or things like incubation period and now people are like this is just a familiar thing that we're, we're all happy with um so I, I think it's probably part of me that would want to actually push forward and you know have things that are perhaps a bit more challenging um rather than what at the moment i, I think it's you know it's a lot of nice background for for things that are now familiar to people um, but there's probably a higher baseline that you could then expand on some of these, you know, like the nuances of super spreading or some of these network things, or possibly even putting in more maths, which I'm, I'm not sure my publisher would be happy about a bunch of equations, but that, that kind of thing. Um, I think the other aspect which um, has really sort of come to the fore in the last uh, year or so is, is not just the, the, the kind of the theory and the abstract discussion of pandemics. I mean, you know, whenever we worked on, um, a TV show or radio thing pre-COVID, you know, you're looking back to the 19 pandemic and it was all very abstract. And I think we worked on a show in, in 2018 and it was collecting data, it was trying to do some modeling, but it was this, this very distant concept. I think now people have much more awareness of what's the data we're seeing in real time. How do we make sense of that? And there's, there's a bit of that in the paperback, but obviously we're still in the middle of a pandemic. And I think there's still going to be things coming along. I mean, I know before we came on here, we were just, we were just trying to make sense of what's, um, currently happening and I think there's probably a lot more that could be structured around those kind of discussions you know with variants emerging um, all, all of these these kinds of features of what we're seeing um, I think we had some of that early on I mean so in the new version I talk a bit about some of the work that Next Strain and Code did um, with those early cases in the US those early phylo phylogenetic signals um, but I think there's going to be a whole bunch of other stories over the course of the pandemic to be told about you know given this really patchy noisy delayed data how have people converged on really sensible things to say and when you're thinking about writing uh it as popular science there's going to be a whole few years in which you're not going to have to explain those contacts those concepts and then they're going to suddenly become more complicated as people hopefully don't yeah. have them on top of their minds all, all that time um that's so i was going to out of, just out of interest, I was going to ask you, um, my, my impression is that one of the things that we've done, um, we, I mean, as just like a group of people trying to understand the course of things so far in the current pandemic, that we, one of the things we've really struggled with is behavior change. Um, I mean, I've been saying it recently when people ask me, um, when do you think this is going to close? Or what do you think is going to happen here? Or what's going to do there? And I always say, the virus is easy. It's the people who are hard. And this is, I mean, again, you know, I can do infectious agents, but contagion is not only about infectious agents, it's about people. I mean, it's about people's behaviors. To what extent do you think we could perhaps learn from that and learn from some of the things that you've talked about in here in terms of improving our understanding of, um, of outbreaks in the future? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And that's, that's always the thing that, if you look at um, the, the infections we can predict better and worse, you know, the ones particularly like this where widespread change in behavior can change the shape um, are enormously difficult. Cause you have things like school terms where you know that, you know when that's gonna happen, you know what the contact patterns are gonna do. Um, but we've seen it in the UK, you know, that um, 
technically we, we have no restrictions in place. Um, but the many, many people are still working from home. Contacts are, are less than half what they were pre-COVID. So there are these changes independent of what's a top-down measure happening. And then it's that question of, well, how do you predict um, what the epidemic is going to do? But I think, I mean, more, more broadly feeding into those other aspects of behavior. So attitudes towards vaccines, for example, um, and then yeah. you know, all the information ecosystem that functions around that. I think that's going to be super important. And one of the things that, that did struck, struck me a bit um, when I was talking to people in that internet um, uh, sphere and the, the kind of social media in the book is we have huge amounts of data, in particular over the last decade, accumulated all this information. But a lot of it is to solve, without being rude, quite boring problems. You know, sort of how do you get a tweet about you know a celebrity to to go more viral and fundamentally that's not you know th th there are these these deeper problems of well how do we make people healthier or happier or, or all these other things but that's often been i mean first of all just more difficult because proving the kind of the causal link of this this affects this health outcome years down the line is much, that's much a harder. huge 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 deal shout out to my causal inference colleagues here they're, they're some of the yeah. best in the business but you know they're i mean really that's really and that was one of the bits of the book actually that, that I, I found fascinating talking to people in that field because those are those are really meaningful questions but they're really tough particularly on the sort of time scales but also just the the ethical side that anytime there's been the, the, i don't know if you remember the facebook the, the happiness study um a few years mm -hmm. ago where they show people happier and less happy content and saw if it transmitted. Um, and it was, it was partly motivated by this idea that if you see lots of happy content online, you get, you're less happy because you're sort of, it's the, the relative effect. Um, and it, it didn't seem to be that effect, but it was enormously controversial because you, was, you were manipulating these features of, of people's behavior that they care about. Yeah, I can't remember um, what they did with the, with the human subjects angle of that, but it certainly seems like it's, it's messing with people via social yeah. media. And it's, but I think that, that that's kind of the, uh, really the area that is going to require a lot of focus because it, it's online information that influences real life behavior. And you know, that's so, going to be such an important part of how COVID ends, but also all of these other aspects of health that we're going to see knock on effects in, in coming years. And, and not just in terms of a disease, but you know, other aspects of behavior that are influenced by what people see and, and life choices and all of this kind of thing. But it's, it's really tough to study and it's often very controversial to study. So I, I think writing the book pre-COVID, it really struck me that, you know, we've got a great understanding of, you know, which viral news article about something quite innocuous is going to be better or which headline you want to put on it. But this idea of how do we, you know, enable people to be in a position that they're, they're going to have better um, life outcomes a few years down the line, I think there's, there's still some huge work to be done. Yeah, I mean, it's the difference between, it's, like what, it's implementation science. Yeah. Because, you know, we know a lot of things, um, but actually persuading individuals to act upon them is a completely different thing. And sort of related to that, um, I was curious as to your view, well, let me start, let me start somewhere else. Um, can I give you the opportunity to say, to explain something, which I keep wanting to explain, and I'm curious to know how you would explain it. Many of the listeners may know this already but models are not forecasts. You know, the results of a mathematical, you know, mechanistic model is not a forecast. Um, again, people seem to continue to think that it is. I mean, can, can you say a few words about, and this is true for something which is to do with infectious disease or to do with other things as well. It's just a, it's a very common misunderstanding and I was curious as to how you would confront it. Yeah, I've, I've grappled with this a lot because I think there's, there, there's often this, you know, either this fatalistic is going to happen or, you know, it doesn't happen and everyone gets very annoyed. I think in part, it's probably because most people's day-to-day -day exposure to forecasts is weather. And that's something that, you know, if, if, if you forecast it's going to rain, you, you don't affect the weather system. But if you have a scenario model that says, if we don't do anything, we're going to run into trouble, people will, well, you'd hope, do something. And I think the best, yeah, the best way I've, fun to describe it which maybe isn't a very good way but is is thinking of these things particularly in how they feed into policymakers not as sort of from afar trying to predict the system of the disease and the policymakers and all of these kind of things and how they're going to play out but it's more sort of decision making toolkit that if someone's going to be introducing 
control measures or a vaccine campaign, having those options laid out is the sort of um, of decision making aid you might want. You know, if you're if you, I don't know if you're playing a game of poker or something, you know, often people have little calculators helping them out um, make make sense of those things. They won't have someone over their shoulder being like, "I reckon in an hour's time you're going to be doing this." Um, and I think for me, it's that. Is that difference? I, I think just our, 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 most people's experience of models and predictions is very much focused on these systems that we can't change, or it's very hard to change. And dealing with things that we can, I think, is probably slightly less familiar to most of us. And that, that's it's really interesting you say that because you've just given me you've just given me a really good idea. I mean, the, the, the first thing I want to say is that yes, I completely agree in terms of when you present people a bunch of options. I think that's the important thing to say, you know, because as scientists. You know, I cannot tell you what to do about, you know, I don't want to be a person telling you whether or not to say cancel the Premier League. But I can say, if you do this, then we expect the outcome to be something like this. We can, you know, I can do that kind of thing when it comes to infectious disease. But the thing I wanted to come back to is maybe we just hit on something here. It's the type of modeling that is happening in in infectious disease and some of these other things where we have an actual mechanistic model can be seen as being a bit like a weather forecast where rain is forecast for tomorrow but if enough people take umbrellas it won't rain yeah so the people who are taking the umbrellas are stopping the rain for everybody um again so i think there might be something interesting there in terms of uh you know messaging going forward um, i wanted to just touch on one other thing which is I mean, we've we have um, read and con sometimes contributed to uh, relatively complicated, and certainly in in, in inter-pandemic times, there's a lot of very complicated models which perhaps sort of demonstrate how quite counterintuitive things can be achieved with a particular set of parameter estimates or a particular set of assumptions. Um, now that's one thing that's interesting, but I was curious as to, I'm, I'm quoting a colleague of mine and I'm not going to say who it is, but in some of these situations, what you actually need are the back of the envelope calculations. And you need people to take the back of the envelope calculations seriously. And I'm just curious as to how you, you know, as to how you feel about that, because you can come up with very complicated models and I love a very complicated model as much as the next nerd. Um, but sometimes what I really want is something simple. Yeah, and I think it's almost like looking back over the last 18 months of, of where have the, the really useful insights come. And, and, you know, it's that I think often it's getting things that are early. And I think things that are rough, but rough in the right way, um, as in, in the right direction, point the right to conclusion is better than you know, a lovely complicated model that just comes too late. Um, and I think there's been a few occasions where people you know, kind of get lost in the details a little bit. I mean, if you look at um, the, the early stage of the outbreak, as soon as we had the IFR of this thing, it, it sort of didn't really matter whether you were estimating 60% or 70% or 80% yeah. of the population are going to get it. You're, just, you're, you, you know, you're getting a massive number that's going to collapse your health system. And it, it, I think for me, there were, there were these moments where there was a lot of argument about these. And we had similar coming into the, the winter wave last year that people were disagreeing about whether it was going to peak at 1,000 or 1,500 or you know, 2,000 without taking a step back and being like, these are all enormous numbers. You know, in the UK, this was all kind of going to massively exceed the first wave. And I think for me, it was almost that, you know, if you can show a rough calculation that these outcomes are all going to look very bad, in a way that's more powerful than something that gets you a huge amount of precision um, in terms of you know just how collapsed your health system is going to be. I think that that's really, I mean, just speaking personally, I have a very similar experience um, myself, except it was, I think it was some point in the middle of February, I was, uh, I was outside the isolation unit in Tel Aviv and somebody who was working in the hospital there just asked me what would happen if we did nothing. Yeah. And I said, what, absolutely nothing? And he said, yes, absolutely nothing. And I just thought about rough estimates of the IFR and a proportion of the population getting becoming infected. And I said, roughly between two and a half and a hundred million people would die. Yeah. 
And the point of that is that the lowest bound of that is already worse than a bad flu year. In fact, a very bad flu year. It's not as bad as 1918, 19, but it's still enough to be taking it extremely seriously. And that was the optimistic. That was the optimistic call that I was making. The, obviously a huge range of estimates, but the fact that the lower bound was bad was very important for me. Um, I wanna ask you one more question, which you should feel free to expound upon. Um, before I'm gonna to move to the questions which have been coming in here. I have often reflected that in some ways, SARS-CoV-2 has, it, it is a remarkably difficult virus to deal with because it's not actually that pathogenic. It's not that virulent. If you want to talk about the original SARS, or indeed, if you want to talk about MERS or Ebola, you're talking about a far higher infection fatality rate. But in the case of SARS-CoV-2, you have something which spreads pre-symptomatically or minimally symptomatically. You have something which the great majority of people will recover from fully. And yet which, if you allow uncontrolled transmission, certainly before vaccines, is going to crush your healthcare system and leave huge numbers of people with long-term sequelae. But you have this difficulty then arising from the fact that I, I think that I said this to Kai Kupferschmidt at Science once. It's a bit like watching a zombie movie and there's a high proportion of the people who just cannot see the zombies and are refusing to believe the zombies exist, even though the zombies are like killing folks around them and eating their brains just because of the fact that they, you know, they're, they're refusing to see them. I just wondered how you felt about the difficulty of, you know, in some ways, this is the combination of factors that make this a very serious pandemic virus are that it's not actually that virulent, but it is virulent enough. Yeah. I think that's a, yeah, that's a really good point because it, it's these comments, if you, and, and I've sometimes felt that it almost has this combination of parameters that encourages people to make bad decisions or, or makes decisions very, very difficult because if you had something that was, you know, as you said, very high IFR, it would be, you know, it, and it, it almost certainly won't. But like, if if we were to get a mutation or a new pandemic with that, it would be very clear what countries would do to to, to handle it. Um, likewise, if we got something where there was very little pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic transmission, it would be treated like SARS. If it was a much longer serial interval, like Ebola, you know, contact tracing. Um, but all of these, you know, and as we saw with a lot of the kind of contact tracing closure type measures, it landed at that border that if you did it very, very well, as we've seen, some, some countries had prolonged success with containment, um, but any slip and Delta just moved that even more. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think almost probably moved more to making those decisions easier because it just can't be controlled with sustainable measures um, in the vast majority of countries. So it, it's almost kind of tipped it more into that territory. Um, but I think as well, I mean, the, the age distribution, uh, you know, I, I sort of wonder if we'd had something like that. If it were reversed. Which, which was, yeah, which was hitting children, hitting the workforce. Um, and it, it does just create that, I think that challenge that, I mean, certainly early on, um, these, you know, a lot of these numbers were abstract. And even as it was spreading, I think it just makes it abstract to people. And unfortunately, because it, it, in the UK and US, I think a lot of other countries, it was hitting you know, the social care part of the population. It was hitting vulnerable groups, people who probably don't have a lot of visibility in daily life anyway. And I think all of those things just came together to unfortunately create, create wave after wave where probably suboptimal decisions um, were being made. And I think one thing that I've really struggled to communicate is in, you know, what you see in hindsight is is just so different in terms of the epidemic curve to what you see in real time. And just to give you an example, like you know where we're in last autumn with very low levels, it was so hard to persuade people that it could ever get back up to that high point, because I think people become so anchored. And as you said, um, because it's this idea that oh well, there are these people who've recovered and okay, it's okay now, and. I think if it had been something where you were still seeing enormous impacts, um, it probably would have drive, drive more urgency. But it, 
it just felt like it was in that bit of parameter space where people could forget and move on. Well, um, yeah, I, I think that I'm sure that I'm sure that you and I share the, you know, the. I think if I ever hear the words herd immunity in a non-technical discussion with a fellow <laughs> epidemiologist, I might run for the hills. I mean, I, I'm or, sorry, if I never hear it again, it'll be too yeah. soon. It's just been very, very difficult dealing with that. Um, before, I know I promised to move to the questions, sure. but I also know that this is not only about infectious disease. I want to ask you, what's your favorite non-infectious disease example in here? Um, because one, one I really enjoyed actually was, um, I think some of the behavioral stuff was, was fascinating, but there's also um, a lot of work's been done on the spread and evolution of stories and fairy tales and sort of treating those, you know, as you'd have a genome and you look at changes in different parts and you use that to try and reconstruct the evolutionary relationship between say different pathogens. Um, a lot of work trying to understand common features of stories and reconstruct the evolution and even if you look at the an anecdotes it's just fascinating history you know so goldilocks the original version it was a sweary old woman who robbed some bears and then you know i think there's another version where the bears caught her and tried to set her on fire and there's all these kind of quite dark versions and a lot of the the stories that we're familiar with um the brothers grim collated and, and edited but a lot of these you can trace back sort of four thousand years if you if you look at the the, the diversity that would be required um and there's also just within that really nice work of, of looking at different um, different cultures and how they've got different versions of the same thing. So we're, we're all familiar with uh, Red White, Red Riding Hood. Um, but then in Asia, there's the, the sort of tiger grandmother. So there's a, a tiger that, prevent, that pretends to be an elderly relative. And it's using these kinds of methods to work out, well, did it originate in one country and move across? Or was it what we'd know as a recombinant was it kind of two stories that sort of mashed together um and again in that sense uh you know trying to work out um what was going on you know was i think for me a, a really nice I, application of something that's quite familiar in our field with pathogens translated to just a, a, a really unexpected um area of research but also one that's just just interesting is that nice historical aspect of how do people Put together these stories and what actually transmits and which bits get dropped and which cultures move things over that's absolutely wonderful um and i my yeah i did actually as an illustration of something which i did when i was a postdoc and i probably should have been doing more sensible work i i made alignments of some of the different junk mail i've been receiving yeah. and i actually found a recombinant between two very distinct lineages um it was very clearly cut and was a pace and a half through the middle but i'll tell you about that and then when next we're having a beer i want to move to the, to the questions now we've got one question from um which is i think a very interesting one because we've talked about contagion in various different contexts what can you and what can we learn from that vaccination is an effective way of controlling an infectious disease what would be the equivalent of vaccination for the financial system so i think one Probably the most direct equivalent in terms of reducing susceptibility was probably capital requirements on individual. You know, if, you, if, you, if you see vaccination as a kind of you're reducing the individual's chance for a bad outcome, that was probably one of the big ones that happened. Um, but there were other there was there were a whole series of other ones that were proposed, some with more and some with less success. But another one was in the UK splitting the um, commercial and uh, investment activities so kind of ring fencing away the investment banking uh, side but that was far less popular in some other countries because you're essentially interfering with the network and it's it's the it's similar actually if you think of an infectious disease that people are often happier with vaccination they're less happy with you can't interact with people and and i think talking to, to sort of people in the industry that was something that struck me that people were happier to accept some of those measures that were a bit lighter so another one that's been done is a lot of these transactions rather than going over the counter between banks they've now created these kind of central clearing houses so at least there's a lot more visibility on these transactions coming to a single source so it might be creating a super spreader if it if it mm. doesn't have enough capital behind it but you're trying to restructure the network to redu reduce some of these connections um but again those things are much harder but the ones you know forcing banks to hold more capital um seem to be reducing susceptibility and you know a, a bit bit happier in terms of what they what they what they'll take on it's very interesting what you say about the focus on the super spreading as well because that's 
something that's obviously been on our minds for a lot for the last 18 months. Um, there are a couple of there are a couple of questions um, which are actually directed at both of us, but you should you should you know take the lead on this about um, what makes science communication successful or unsuccessful. Um, there's a, in an allied question. There's um, you know are there lost opportunities for a cartoon showing rather than explaining respiratory particles and things like that. I mean what you know. So the first thing, you know, what makes science communication successful versus unsuccessful? That's a very good question. Um, and I'd like to think a little bit in terms of how it comes to me. For me, I think the way I, I, I interact with it, I just like to give people a, a more useful way of thinking that's that's going to give them more information about the situation that they're, they're considering. So, you know, avoiding making really obvious mistakes is one. But then also reducing engagement with, you know, this kind of there's no excess deaths, it's all fine type logic, um, which once you, you sort of understand that process, I think that would hopefully make people far more, um, more cautious. Um, I think also, uh, I think sort of respecting your audience, I think most people are not, you know, looking to, to um to send half harmful information like that i think most people want to be useful and a lot of the the content you see that's misinformation is shared because people are trying to be useful but maybe it's triggered one of those reactions like anger or something else and that's set them off on that road but yeah i'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this i know you've obviously engaged a lot with this yeah um it's i mean it's interesting you say that i mean i think i think the first well i think respect is really important um i mean i People often talk a great deal about um, parents who don't vaccinate their children. And I was trying to point out, well, I mean, I think that they should vaccinate their children with some exemptions in case of medical exemptions and so on. But I want to remember that these people think they're being good parents. That they are trying to be very caring about their child and they're trying to look into it and they're trying to care for their child. So that motive is a thing which is important to remember. Um, the people who try to convince them are in an entirely different situation. Um, I think that it's important to distinguish here between science communication and public health communication. In science communication, I think it's important to come up with relatable examples that people can find um, re relevant to their everyday life, um, or indeed stuff like you were just saying about um, the phylogeny or you know the, the family tree of fairy tales. That's a wonderful way which we can understand things more about the way that we look at how pathogens are related. Um, but when it comes to public health, I think the most important thing is not having a multitude of alternative possible sources of information. Um, unfortunately, the internet doesn't help this. Uh, but in the United States in particular, for much of the first year of the pandemic, we had a situation where you could find one politician saying one thing, another politician saying completely the reverse, and a partisan situation which instantly sorted people into camps independent of the science. And that, I think, is a really bad place to be starting from. So, um, I mean, I, I, I've, um, I've been to the UK once since the start of the pandemic, and it was for a very, very flying visit. I didn't even get to take my second test or my, my third test to get out. Um, but I don't know if you found similar things there. I think I have. And so it's when the book came out, actually, um, the, the hardback version, I did quite a lot of interviews with different countries. And it was quite interesting the level of pol the US, unfortunately, was one of the more polarized ones I saw. But then also, I think just how people approach those. So there were there were some, I think some of the Spanish newspapers that, for example, I talked to were actually it was almost quite philosophical. They were very interested in the, in the underlying ideas and kind of where does that leave us? And then others were, were kind of much more on the, on the kind of political side. So I think there's a little bit of variation between countries, but I, I completely agree, agree with you that when you get to a situation where it's almost politics comes first and then you can just grab the bit of science which someone says fits your, your way of, um, of wanting to do what you want to do, that's where it becomes really tough because you just end up with an inability to converge on a, on a kind of communal solution, which obviously an infectious disease demands. Yeah, I, I, I didn't think I said in an interview, um, <laughs> taking scientific advice does not mean talking to enough scientists until you eventually find one that says what you want to hear. <laughs> um, unfortunately, there's a, there's a question here, which I really like um, as well, 
um, from Greg Burke, which is asking, can models of spread of COVID estimate population damages associated with the refusal to wear a mask or refusal to be vaccinated? Um, I mean, I'm going to leave that to you, but I can think of an answer. Um, so let me just think. That through. Yeah, so I guess this is the um, it's the indirect effect. So yeah, it's yeah, the, yeah we'd, we'd separate vaccination into, as you know, you know the, the benefit you get because you, you mess up to enter the hospital and the benefit others get because you're reducing transmission. Um, and we, we do have that. I mean, in a lot of the, um, the scenario models that, that are put forward, but even just basic calculations you might do of how much vaccination do we need to stop the epidemic, that's all centered around these indirect effects. Because if, you, if you're talking about the epidemic peaking, that's enough accumulation of immunity to stop transmission continuing increasing your epidemic so you can quantify those quite well i think masks i mean it's all it's always harder because it's the the sort of the trade-off between the evidence you can have at the individual level which is very clear cut and then the sort of policy level but i think there's there's a really obvious network calculation that you know if one or two people on a busy train are wearing a mask the protection they're getting is going to be much much lower than if everyone was wearing one because you get those kind of multiplicative um effects yeah, I, but, I, there was actually yeah. a paper that I think estimated that and pointed out that in a situation, if you have a situation where masks prevent transmission, but not acquisition, then people wearing masks are not particularly protected if there's only a few yeah. of them. But as soon as you get a situation where you have two interactions between both people wearing masks, then it starts to have a really significant impact upon the um, upon the spread. Um, so... <laughs> Ah, oh, this is an extremely this isn't this is an interesting one. Uh, how can how can concepts like the less virulent nature of SARS-CoV-2 making it difficult to contain um, be applied to non-infectious disease contexts such as the spread of misinformation? That's from Hai Hao Liu. Um, that's an interesting one. Um, I think I've got a thought, but um, I'll, I'll give a brief thought. Do you, do you want can, me to talk? Can, do you want me to talk first? You, so I give you time you, to think. You can jump it. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think that it I think that it's to do with um, I think there are a couple of things here. First, there's less virulent is like when it's sort of more plausible. And, you know, I've had information shared with me that is obviously predetermined for, for people have shared it with me thinking it's true. And then I've kind of gone, hang on, really? And it turns out not to be. But the plausible things are perhaps less virulent. But I would say that against that, there is a particular degree of partisanship or what have you in which it becomes a virtue to be able to believe six impossible things before breakfast. And so in those circumstances, uh, very difficult to believe um, posts might actually be more transmissible, even though it is less transmissible within the network overall. Um, that was me just that was me just talking off the top of my head. Now, you wrote a book about these things, so you take it away. One thing that struck me actually that was certain the, the online information and particularly the kind of malicious content side of it is just how well some of these groups understand online contagion. Um, and I think that's one thing that makes containment of these things quite difficult because you said that in some cases it will be making content so it slips under the radar. So it's not so obviously wrong or obviously harmful um, that it gets through. And I think one example that, that cops up a lot is media manipulation, that a lot of these, these people aren't just tweeting out random things. They'll cluster their tweets around hyper individuals. There's this um, term known as astroturfing, which is where you create this artificial sense of grassroots support for an issue. Um, and then in getting that into, into a media outlet gives that then um, credibility. And then you're almost in a sort of information laundering process where it's not clear that that's come from a manipulator online. It's now in a credible source. It's getting reported by other sources. And then that makes containment much harder because you're sort of packaging up the transmission in things that people don't um, resemble as so much of a problem. Um, but I think the other, the other point you mentioned as well about things that are, are quite obviously wrong, I think there's also the in-group dynamic there. And I think there's sometimes people almost want to be seen to share content, even if it's... Um, implausible because it demonstrates they're part of that bit of the network so i think those that the, the sort of two sides to the problem but i think for me 
just having awareness that a lot of the people who are doing this stuff um actually you know are, are basically amateur epidemiologists but um unfortunately quite successful in some instances of getting this stuff to spread yeah there are there, there are quite a few amateur epidemiologists i've uh, encountered it has to be so um so we're running towards the hour and i'm thinking that we are probably going to have to start coming to towards a close as a this is a relatively long question here, which I'm gonna. Uh, that's one of my late. That's one of my later appointments, making itself known. Um, so I think this is a. This is an issue which is good for you to perhaps start coming into a close on. Given your research on various forms of contagion, and especially about notable past pandemics, what has surprised you the most? The most about the various struggles we've encountered over the last 18 months, because given we have a lot of widespread access to information. I mean, um, anonymous attendee, I'm thinking widespread access to information is not necessarily widespread access to accurate information, but um, we definitely have more information than previous generations. Um, and it might be easier to avoid the pitfalls of misinformed thinking. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. So, so what, that's the question. What is the most? What has surprised you the most? So I think one of the things particularly early on that surprised me is, is just the diversity in global responses. You know, I think it, it didn't, you didn't have to get that far into the pandemic where we had pretty established information about severity, transmission, some other features, and countries just took widely different paths based on that same set of scientific information. So I think whether it's politics, culture, everything else feeding in. Um, but I think now... For me, the, the thing that I find astonishing, I think historians looking back will find just incredible, is if you look at where we're going to end up globally on deaths or excess deaths, some, some reliable measure of mortality in a few years' time, and look back and say, when did we know we had highly effective vaccines available? And I think for me, that it's been surprising how good the vaccines are and how quickly they've come. I think that's something probably a lot of people in science did not give enough credit to the wonderful groups putting this stuff together, but also how it's played out subsequently. I, I think it, I don't think any, I think anyone, if you'd told them you'd have these vaccines ready to go, that, that this is how it would end. I think that would have been quite hard to believe, but um, yeah. Uh, what, what, what's yours? What's the big one for you? That, you that's a, those are, that's a very good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all around. I'm, I am, like you, I am bowled over by the multitude of vaccines. Yeah, even the ones that people think are not so good are still you know, preferable to encountering the virus without any education in your immune system. Um, but the ones that we actually have are remarkable. And I think that one of the, it's been very difficult here, recently noting that the United States is having a really significant additional morbidity and mortality, that's people getting sick and dying, even when many of those lives could have been saved by vaccines. But they haven't been for multiple reasons. Not only hesitancy, there's a lot of, um, there's been comments in the Q&A about hesitancy, but also access. Um, lots of people in the US have struggled to achieve, to get vaccine access. And there's a big contrast with places like Israel or the UK, which, you know, for all that I can, Dis the UK and often do. The country did an extremely good job at immunizing the most vulnerable members of the population. And so there are very, very high vaccination rates in the older age groups. Whereas here in the United States, we have large parts of the country where 30%, 40% of the over 65s are not vaccinated. And I'm just, that bowls me over. Um, we don't, you know, people don't realize that. 80% vaccinated sounds like it's almost as good as 90% vaccinated, but actually it's twice as bad because it means that the pool of people who are still vulnerable is twice as large, 20% compared to 10%. And so that's possibly the thing which um, has astonished me the most. But that's now. I think early on, the thing which has surprised me most is the ways in which people contorted themselves to try and believe that it wasn't really happening. Um, 
those of us who've been here have you know struggled to get to that stage and i can't wait for a point at which it is going to be actually in the rearview mirror and and i'll have far fewer twitter followers to say oh, the least. wait give yeah. me five five hundred and a bit of niche science chat any day yeah five five hundred and some niche stuff on um a recombination that'd be cool um so i believe <laughs> too much information yes you know, Gwen Speed says uh, the issue is too much information, and I think that that's, and then there's comments about the in effect of the internet. I think this is the first real pandemic of this sort in the internet age, and people are going to be writing PhDs on it for years to come. But if you want to get a start on it, the rules of contagion, I, I noticed it came out, I hadn't realized exactly when it was, and it kept being pushed at me um, by um, online places where you should not buy books because it's better to help your, you know, your local bookstore. Um, and I looked at it and I thought, um, I don't need to read that. You know, I know all already. Well, I can tell you, I don't. <laughs> if you want to know more about it, um, then go get Adam's book. Um, I don't know if Lauren's going to come in and close us out, but I want to say thank you to everyone who's asked questions. I want to say thank you to Adam, who I have spoken to before, but I've never actually met properly, I don't think. Have we met? I don't think in person. I think we've had probably the odd call or something, but yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's it, but we've never, and we haven't, still haven't met in person, but it's nice yeah. to actually see your face. Um, and uh, thanks to Harvard Bookstore for getting this together and because it's been, it's been a really entertaining way to spend my lunch break. Yes, thank you both so much, Adam and Bill, for this fascinating conversation. I wish we could have gone on for another hour, but um, yes. Thank you to all of you for spending your afternoon with us. Please do check out and purchase the Rules of Contagion at harvard.com. I just posted the link again in the chat, or you can just go to harvard.com to find it. Um, thank you. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, enjoy the rest of your day. Keep reading, and please take care. Thank you so much. Thank you.